This video covers the essentials of Minecraft. Most of it should be helpful whether you want to be a vanilla survivor, architect, redstoner, challenge map player, mini gamer, faction server player, modded survivor, or if you want to make your own challenge map servers, external tools, or mod. If you want to make your own resource packs, you'll have to learn some very different things, so only like the first two minutes of this will be of any use to you. You may still watch all of it if you have time. I will be completely honest with you, no single video can cover everything there is to know about Minecraft. Here are three important links to where you can find more information. The first link, minecraft.gamepedia.com, is the official Minecraft wiki. There you can find almost everything you need to know about Minecraft. Then there's minecraftforum.net, which is the official unofficial Minecraft forum. The history is quite complicated. I've spent some time there, the community is actually pretty nice. Then of course there's youtube.com slash channel slash capital U C lowercase m capital T lowercase F W capital E two lowercase N F three C capital B P lowercase D P capital O E A A lowercase E four capital T A, which is my amazing channel. Please visit and subscribe ASAP. All three links should be in the description. First, when you launch Minecraft, you should see this title screen. The yellow text is called Splash. There are almost always references to something. You can ignore it if you want. This button is single player. When you first get on, you most likely won't have any world, so you have to make one. I'll get into that later. This button is multiplayer. It allows you to find and join servers by IP. Any worlds open to LAN on computers using the same network will appear here. The Add Server button adds an already existing server to your list. The Direct Connect button allows you to join a server whether or not it's on the list. The Join Server button makes you join the selected server. The Edit button allows you to change the name that the selected server appears on your list as. And the delete button removes the server from your list. The refresh button refreshes the list and fixes some issues. Now this next button on the title screen is Realms. Realms are public servers that can be played anywhere with internet connection if you are invited. They cost about 10 US dollars per month. You can learn more about them by clicking on the What is Realms button. The play button allows you to join the selected realm, the buy realm button allows you to make your own realm, the configure button lets you change the settings if the selected realm is yours, the leave realm button deletes your invitation if the selected realm isn't yours. This button on the title screen is the language button. It allows you to change the language you play with. This is the options menu. You can change the field of view or or how much your player sees at once. The skin customization button allows you to determine which parts of your skin is visible. In case you didn't know, the skin determines what your player looks like to yourself and other players. The current default skin is called Alex, but you can customize it. The music and sound settings changes how loud various sounds can play. The video settings determine how the game looks, but have no effect on gameplay. Since there are so many, I will only explain the most important ones. Selecting fancy graphics allows for better effects such as transparent leaves. Selecting fast graphics emits those effects in exchange for better performance. The render distance controls how many chunks are visible at once. The number you enter here determines the radius of the rendering in chunks, which are 16 by 256 by 16 blocks each. Increasing render distance drastically decreases performance. If you turn on smooth lighting, the lighting looks more realistic. Turning it off makes the lighting look blocky but slightly improves the performance. The max frame rate button limits the frame rate. Setting it to 60 FPS is considered optimal as any more FPS will cause it to draw frames you never see, overworking the GPU and decreasing performance. View bobbing determines whether the camera bobs as the player walks. Turning it off slightly improves performance. USB sync 
limits the frame rate to the screen's refresh rate, enabling it fixes tearing, but may cause stuttering. The language button allows you to change the language viewed by the client. Force Unicode determines what font is used for text. Turning it off causes the game to display ASCII text. Chat settings determines how chat is displayed. I won't explain it all in this video because it isn't very important. Resource packs are fan-made folders of data that change how the game looks and sounds but have no effect on gameplay. Snooper settings determines whether or not Mojang collects your data and uses them to fix problems. The quit game button should be self-explanatory. Now I will explain Minecraft worlds. Your worlds are accessed through the single player button. You can select a world and then play, rename, or delete it. But before you can select a world, you need to create or download one. I won't cover downloading in this video, but here's how to create a world. First, you are asked to name the world. Then, you choose a game mode. Survival and Hardcore are for challenging yourselves, and Creative is for doing things that otherwise cannot be done, such as building challenge maps. The game mode can be changed after a world is created, so don't feel too much pressure. The will be saved in is the name of the folder that the world's data will be saved in. You may notice that they are hyphens. Since two folders in a single folder can't have the same name, worlds with the same name have different numbers of hyphens. You can click the More World Options button to customize your world further. When most computers randomly generate things like terrain, it uses a seed. The Minecraft terrain generator uses the same seed for all world generation. Two worlds with the same seed, same version, and same customizations will generate exactly the same. That seed does not affect what happens to a part of the world after it generates. That, my friend, is all up to you. And some other random number generator. The Generate Structures button determines whether seemingly man-made structures generate. Some things, like trees, are technically structures, but are not affected by this. Allow Cheats enables use of commands. Some commands, like slash tell and slash c, can be used regardless. Bonus Chest determines whether a chest of useful stuff generates near your spawn point and is disabled in hardcore mode. World type is where it really starts to get interesting. Default generates a realistic looking world, albeit with small biomes. Super flat generates worlds in layers of blocks. A super flat world consists only of one biome and does not generate mobs along with the terrain like pigs or sheep. You can customize the layers generated, the biome, and which structures are allowed to generate, and how frequently each generates. Large biomes make biomes twice as big as they are in default worlds. A map of a default world will look like a zoomed out version of a map of a large biome world with the same seed. Amplified sort of exaggerates the terrain, making taller hills and deeper ravines. Customized allows you to customize just about everything. Okay, now to actually play the game. First, air control. To move the mouse to turn around, W is forward, S is backward, space is jump, hold down left click to break blocks, spam left click to attack entities, Right click is used so selected item or interact with a block or an entity. The crosshairs at the center of the screen are what is moved when you move the mouse. It determines where you face, where you go when you press W or S, and what you interact with when you click. You can interact with anything up to 4 meters away from your eyes. Q is drop the selected item and E is open your inventory. It also serves to close any GUI, including your inventory. You can use the scroll wheel to change the selected item, or you can use number keys. More controls can be found in this menu. In addition, you can also change the buttons used for most of these controls. I would recommend changing drop item to something like G, P, or backslash so you don't accidentally press the button while you're playing the game. Some controls cannot be changed, like moving the mouse, pressing escape to open this menu, F1 which hides the heads up display, F2 which takes a screenshot, and F3 which opens the debug info that contains all sorts of useful stuff. There are also controls for GUIs that show your inventory. Your inventory can be viewed by pressing E, or by right-clicking on things like crafting tables, containers, or villagers. 
These UIs can be closed by pressing E or Escape. First, your inventory has a 9-slot hotbar, which is stuff you can select by pressing number of keys or scrolling. Above the hotbar, there are 27 more slots, so your inventory can fit 36 stacks of items, excluding the armor slot. Most kinds of items, and all blocks, stack up to 64 before any more of them can fit into one stack. Many don't stack like these cakes, and three kinds of items stack up to 16. The armor slots are where you can place armor and other stuff like mob heads so that you wear it. There's an animation of you that changes if you change your skin, put on or take off armor, get lit on fire, get hit by arrows, or a bunch of other stuff. In survival, hardcore, or adventure mode, there's a crafting grid for simple or shapeless recipes, like crafting logs into planks. In creative mode, there's a slot that instantly destroys any item you place in it, as well as tabs, including a search tab where you can find a lim unlimited of almost any item. Now I will teach you how to move items around. Left click picks up a stack, left click again to drop it. If placed in a preoccupied slot, you pick up the item that was in the slot. Right clicking on a stack picks up half of it, right clicking on an empty slot, De will deposit one. Drag left click to distribute the items evenly among the slots covered. Drag right click to place one item in each slot covered. If you shift click, the item is transferred directly from the inventory to the hotbar or vice versa. Or when interacting with a container, directly to or from the container. If you shift click from the output slot of a crafting grid or a villager, like this, it gives the maximum number of items in the output slot that can be crafted or traded from the items in the input slot. Notice how 8 gold ingots will give me 1 emerald, so putting 64 gold ingots in here and shift clicking once will give me 8 emeralds. Oh wait, that's weird. Nope, never mind. The trade got locked. Huh? It didn't go all the way through. Whatever. Huh? When you press escape while playing, a menu appears and the game pauses if on single player. Back to game should be pretty obvious and pressing escape again will also resume the game. Achievements allows you to see which achievements you've earned in that world. Although achievements can be earned in any game mode except spectator, they're useful in survival single player and little else. Statistics records n numbers of things you've done in that world. There's general, blocks, items, and mobs. Options opens the same menu that was previously explained on the section about the title screen. However, opening this menu from a world allows you to change its difficulty. This button is not available from the title screen because as of 1.8, you can have different difficulties in different worlds. Peaceful causes rapidly regenerating health and prevents monsters from spawning and hunger depletion. Easy causes monsters to spawn, but they're not very dangerous. Normal makes the monsters stronger and some gain abilities that aren't in easy. Hard makes monsters extremely powerful and allows hunger to kill you. You can lock the difficulty in any world to challenge yourself and prevent temptation to change to an easier difficulty. The open to land button allows other people to use the same network to join your world. Like I said before, land worlds appear at the bottom of the multiplayer menu. However, problems with land worlds are frequent and bothersome to fix. The save and quit to title button does just what it says. Each world has three parts. They are the overworld, the nether, and the end. The overworld is where players spawn when creating a world or joining a server. Uncustomized, it looks mildly realistic and is the only dimension to have multiple biomes, a daylight cycle, and normally functioning beds, compasses, and clocks. It's also the only dimension that's customizable by any world option other than the sea. The other dimensions can be accessed by portals. The portal shown on the left is another portal, the one shown on the right is an end portal.
Huh. The overworld is 60 million meters by 256 meters by 60 million meters. Huh. I don't know how large the other dimensions are because the game crashes when I try to teleport to the huh. edge. Each dimension is divided into chunks. If you were listening earlier, each chunk is 16 by 256 by 16 huh. blocks as visualized by these redstone blocks here. The entirety of each chunk is either rendered or not rendered. If no players are rendering a chunk that isn't within 16 chunks of the world's spawn point, the chunk will unload and be saved to the hard drive and everything and it will freeze. If somebody tries to render a chunk that doesn't exist, that chunk will generate. This is why changing the code that generates the world by switching versions or downloading mods will cause vertical cliffs and abrupt biome boundaries on chunk borders. Beneath each dimension is the void, which will kill anything, including players in creative or spectator mode, no matter how much protection and or resistance it has. Entities that go beyond the 60 million meter limit will also die, but not if they go above the world. Luckily, the nether always has an unbreakable bedrock layer at the bottom, and the overworld does too, unless it's customized. There are two things that make up the Minecraft world. They are blocks and entities. First, I will explain blocks. Each block space is a 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter cube. There are three rules regarding how blocks behave and apply to all blocks. First, each block space has exactly one block in it. Anything that doesn't look like a block but is within building limits is actually an air block. This also explains why all blocks either block flowing water or get destroyed by it. If you think two slabs can fit into one block, what you're thinking of is actually a different block called a double slab. See? They're different. The debug screen never lies. You may also have noticed that two different kinds of slabs cannot stack to form a double slab. The next rule is that each block can only occupy one space. Beds, doors, and double plants are actually two blocks that behave as one when placed or broken. The third and final rule is that any item that shares a numerical ID with a block, meaning that it will become that block when placed, stacks up to 64. Aside from these similarities, blocks are very diverse. Some are transparent, some are opaque, and some diffuse light. Some are non-solid, some are partially solid, and some are completely solid. Although all blocks are technically cubic meters, some blocks have different widths and heights to entities that are colliding with them, like me. This nether brick fence is only one block, but it's one and a half blocks tall to entities that are standing on it and trying to jump over it, which makes it look like I'm floating half a meter in the air. Some blocks have items associated with them, and some don't. When supporting blocks are removed, some blocks float, some fall, and some break. Some blocks glow, and some blocks don't. Different blocks have different blast resistances, but a large enough explosion will destroy anything, and probably crash the game in the process. When default textures are used, each pixel each meter is 16 pixels. This means that blocks smaller than a 1 by 1 by cube by 1 cube have less pixels in their textures. Entities are textured differently, which I'll get to in a moment. Entities are anything that interacts and is not a block. They break the rules that I listed before when I was talking about blocks. There are eight kinds of entities. They are players, like me, drops, like items, or experience, immobile, projectiles, blocks, such as falling blocks or prime TNT, vehicles, which are boats and various mine carts, hostile mobs and passive mobs. Most entities can move, be damaged, or set on fire. All entities can die, but some can't die without commands. Most entities are partially solid and can push other entities around. Some, like this bow, are completely solid and can be stood on. 
Drops are dropped by other blocks and entities. Some contain items, others contain experience. They can be picked up by players and some mobs can pick up items. They drop these spawns after 5 minutes. As you may have guessed, immobile entities are the only entities that never move without command. Projectiles are short-lived and all of them either die when they hit a solid block such as these snowballs or after a set amount of time like these arrows. When blocks fall, they actually become entities until they land. With command, it's possible to have a falling block turn into any block upon landing and any block can damage entities. Yes, even a dead bush. Prime TNT is what TNT turns into when primed and explodes after 4 seconds or less. Vehicles are either controlled by a player riding them or, or by the rails that they run on or both. Mobs, short for mobile, are the first moving entities. Mobs are basically the animals in Minecraft. They are two kinds, hostile and peaceful. All hostile mobs can damage players and other mobs in some way, like this zombie. Hostile mobs despawn on peaceful difficulty, with the exception of ender dragons. Those stop attacking when peaceful. Peaceful mobs do not voluntarily attack players, though some attack when provoked. As implied by their name, their behavior does not change when the difficulty switches from easy to peaceful. Most mobs can be spawned by spawn eggs available in the creative inventory. Now I will expand on game mode. Survival mode is when the player has health, the heart, hunger, the shanks, armor, the chest plate, air, the bubbles, and experience, which is the, the big bar on the bottom that turns green. As you gain experience and the number on top of it gets bigger as you level up. In survival mode, all blocks are either breakable or unbreakable, and the selected item only affects the break speed and the drops. When the player runs out of health, he or she dies and drops all of his or her items and some of his or her experience, unless the game will keep inventory is true. He spawns at the world spawn point or the last place that he or she had the spawn point set. In creative mode, the player has access to to the creative inventory with almost with almost unlimited of any item. In his or her regular inventory, there's a destroy item button that destroys any item placed in it. Click on an item multiple times to get multiple items. Shift click to get a full stack. And click on a click on an item while holding a different item to draw it and destroy the item. In creative mode, the player is unaffected by any of the bars that I listed before. But if he or she changes into creative mode and back to another game mode, the values in the bars are preserved. Because of this, a player in creative mode can only die by falling into the void or being targeted by the slash kill command. A player in creative mode can fly by double tapping space, go up or down by pressing space or left shift respectively. The player automatically lands when he or she hits the ground while pressing left shift. In creative mode, left clicking on Almost any block instantly destroys it. The only blocks that aren't instantly broken are those without hitboxes like air and water. Additionally, tools will lose their ability when used and 
items that are normally consumed when used on consumed when used in creative mode and any enchantment or repair can be done on an anvil. Adventure mode is just like survival mode, except that the player can't break a block unless he or she is holding an item with a special NVP tag. Players also can't place blocks unless that block has another special NVP tag. In spectator mode, the player is constantly flying and can only die from the void or the slash kill command. Players in spectator mode are invisible to players in other game modes. They don't interact with things like these pressure plates, and they clip through blocks. They can open their in inventory and GUIs, but can't interact with them. Uh. If a spectator left clicks on a mob or another player, they go inside of it and see whatever the player or mob is seeing. You can leave the player or mod by pressing shift. There is something worth mentioning that isn't technically a game mode. That is hardcore mode. Differences between hardcore and other game modes are that players cannot switch to or from hardcore mode. When a world is created, it is either hardcore or not hardcore. That cannot be changed either. However, when player, players in hardcore mode can still be in any game mode previously mentioned. The way this works is that all Hardcore does is keep the difficulty locked at hard, change the sprites of the hearts that you can see here, and keeps players from respawning after the die. It, in single player, it deletes the world, and in multiplayer, they get banned. Any feature of a game mode can still be used in a hardcore world by a player cha changing to that game mode. As you may have guessed, the default game mode for all hardcore modes is survival. Now to touch briefly on commands. There are dozens of commands and entire websites dedicated to generating commands used for all sorts of purposes. Commands are used to create challenge maps or mini games inside of Minecraft that rival the best 3D platformers and turn-based strategy games and are completely vanilla. Don't believe me? Go to Cube Hamsters or Seth Link's YouTube channel or search things like Minecraft forums or Planet Minecraft for all sorts of cool creations. First, chat is open when you press T. Anything entered in chat that doesn't start with a forward slash is broadcasted across the world. Anything entered with the forward slash is interpreted as a command and the computer tries to compile it. Then it will either execute the command or return an error message that only the player who entered the command can see. Pressing forward slash will automatically open chat with the forward slash already typed, saving precious seconds for people trying to enter a command. However, by far the most useful way to enter a command is by using a command block. The command block is activated by a redstone signal like this button, and command blocks can ex execute commands longer than commands that can fit in the chat bar. Using special commands, they can also test if certain blocks or entities are present. For the sake of this video, the only commands I will teach you in this video is slash game mode. To enter a slash game mode command, first type slash game mode, and then type S, C, A, or S, P, or 0, 1, 2, or 3, for survival, creative, adventure, or spectator, respectively. Then enter the name of the target player. At P targets the nearest player, at R targets the random player, and at A target all players. 
Entering nothing here will target the player who entered the command if the command is entered in the chat bar. So these are your fundamentals of Minecraft. I hope you learned something from this video. Again, if you want to learn more, visit the Minecraft Wiki or the Minecraft forums. If you have a minute, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.